that can tell me what filter in nature that by random chance would take 50% the right-handed ones out of the mixture and leave only the left-handed ones, or to keep only the right and get out rid of the left. Please explain to me where that happens. So is life just chemistry? Well, life is made out of atoms, molecules, solutions, chemical reactions, that's true. However, when one dies, these chemicals are still there, although they do start to revert to 50-50, and in the case of amino acids, for instance. Uh, thus, we can say that life is more than chemistry, because if I took all of the chemicals in a human body and simply poured it on the floor, it wouldn't form a human body. And what about taxonomy? Now, taxonomy is the ability to uh, pigeonhole, label things, and so forth. Uh, some of you will remember some of this. It's the classification system for naming creatures. For example, there are seven chief groups in the scientific system of classification from kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, although you can make it even finer down to variety. But these are the seven major ones. And, uh, well, how does the ability to classify plants and animals confirm genesis? Well, think with me for a second. You know, the numerous clear-cut gaps which we do see between plants and animal kinds today that do allow plants and animals to be classified, pigeonholed, and say this is a dog and that is a cat and this is a rose, well, that's evidence of creation of separate kinds. If evolution were true, then we would expect to have a mush of things, this tree of life concept that says things are constantly evolving into existence. I'd have a mush from one kind into the next. I shouldn't be able to say, this is a dog, this is a cat. I shouldn't be able to say, this is an animal, that's a plant. But what kind it is, I couldn't say, because if it's halfway from this to that, how can you label it? What about variations in natural selection? Well, these are variations in dogs. Those are different kinds of dogs. But nature would never produce any of those dogs. I mean, think about it. You can take a pair of Heinz 57 dogs, or uh, I do mission work in Brazil. I, I learned a new term for a Heinz 57 dog. They call it a street special. But think about it. Random chance mating of dogs, cats, and so forth in nature will just give you mongrels. It takes human intelligence to get terriers and collies and uh, whippets and so forth. Is that right? Now, today we now know that wolves, dogs, are one kind. Dogs and wolves can mate. As a matter of fact, we now know that coyotes, dogs, wolves, can all mate. So what was the original dog anyway? Variation within cats. All these cats look different, but they're all cats. And what about microevolution versus macro? The variation with the kind versus the jump from one kind to another. Well, microevolution, which is really de-evolution, is small-scale biological lateral downward shifts or variations such as color, size, the shape of nose, shape of ear. Macroevolution would involve large-scale biological changes from one kind to another, such as fish becoming amphibians, amphibians becoming reptiles, reptiles becoming mammals, birds, humans, and so forth. Now, many of you would be familiar with the Galapagos finches, that when Charles Darwin arrived in the Galapagos, he actually cataloged 13 different varieties. So he cataloged 13 different varieties of finches. Um, he said, based on the size of the beak and the shape of the beak and so forth, but genetic studies have been done recently that prove that all 13 varieties of finches are one species. It's just 13 varieties of one species. It's no different than you can have 6.7 billion people on Earth and they all look different from each other. But they're all people. And again, this is a five-legged cow. Now, this fifth leg right here, is it beneficial to the cow? And tell me something. Is this new information coming into existence by random chance? Or is this simply the accidental duplication of previously existing information? Well, I think you'll agree. No new information was added here. The information for legs already existed. This is just a case of the accidental duplication of previously existing information. Or what about these three sheep right here? I think the guy in the middle here, we call him Shorty. How's that? Now, if you had that mutation right there, how long do you think you'd last in nature? I mean, think with me. The first time the wolves attacked, who's going to be dinner? Right? No new information was added. The information for legs was already there, but the information for long legs was lost, leaving only information for short legs. 
And in nature, that creature would never exist for very long, and it would not pass along this mutation to other sheep. Reptiles are very prone to this, the accidental duplication of previously existing information. I mean, how many of you have ever heard of, you know, two-headed snakes, two-headed turtles, and so forth? Now, here, here we have a two-headed turtle. Now, first of all, in nature, we would call that monstrous, because two heads is not right. Um, and I think you'll agree that this is, you know, not a very good mutation. Um, how long would that creature actually exist? Are two-headed snakes and so forth. They only exist because people then keep them in museum-type situations, a zoo and so forth, or in a home condition. But they would never survive in nature. Now, this is a pretty heady book. This is a college-level book on parasitology. However, it has a very interesting quote I want to share with you. Natural selection can act only on those biological properties that already exist. It cannot create properties in order to meet adaptational needs. According to evolution, the atheistic view, uh, genetics doesn't allow to look into the future and say, oh, I need this, so I'll do this to get there. No, it has to be by random chance. Now, survival of the fittest does not explain the arrival of the fittest. Right? Survival of the fittest does not explain arrival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest is circular reasoning. I mean, actually, survival of the fittest is a meaningless terminology. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It has absolutely no value in science whatsoever. Because think of it for a second. It's just a useless tautology, circular reasoning. Why did it survive? Well, because it's the fittest. How do you know it's the fittest? Because it survived. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It means absolutely nothing. It doesn't prove anything about evolution. And finally, think with me for just a moment. Now, I know some of you may watch various natural history type programs and so forth on various TV stations and whatever. Um, first of all, I will say this to you as a creationist. If you must watch these programs, please do me one favor and turn off the sound. There's nothing wrong with the pictures. As a matter of fact, uh, some of these photographers are some of the greatest in the world. Uh, you know, I mean, animals really do play, they really do eat, they really do sleep, etc., etc., and some of the photography is exceptionally good. Catches the animals exactly without them knowing there's any human around. And the pictures can be fine. What's wrong is the narrative. For example, uh, how many of you have seen pictures of seals swimming gracefully through the water? And they're just playing. I mean, they, they're not hunting. They're just enjoying life and so forth. And they're swimming around and playing with each other and so forth. And the narrative says, oh, do you see how for millions of years these creatures evolved to swim so gracefully through the water? I could take the exact same picture, change the narrative and say, do you see how the Creator God designed these creatures to swim so gracefully through the water? It's the same picture. It's just two different interpretations. And let's think for a second about this particular drawing. I mean, again, how many of you have seen these, uh, well, underwater, say, photographies of uh, natural conditions?